SJC 13215, Commonwealth v. Michael Eagles. Okay. Good morning. My name is Dennis Shedd, and I'm representing Michael Eagles. At Eagles 1987 trial for the murder of Lewis Jennings, crime lab analyst Jay Godleski testified that two hairs found in Jennings' hand uh, were consistent with Eagles' hairs. As Yamikas points out, his opinion may have been influenced by the fact that he knew that the questioned hairs had come from the victim's hand and that Eagles was a suspect. Information an analyst would not be given today when we recognize the importance of blind administration. Godleski went on to testify that he only declares hairs to be consistent if they match in every characteristic, that he's familiar with the frequency at which various characteristics occur in the general population, and that the chance that a random person would have matching hair was only one in 4,500. Now, as the Commonwealth acknowledges, newly available evidence shows that that uh, statistical testimony is unsupported by scientific evidence. In fact, nothing is known about the frequency at which various characteristics occur, where those characteristics are independent of so each counsel, other. So, I understand that about the where we're at, and that now the hair hair admiss, hairs are inadmissible. Those comparisons, right? Is that that's where we're at? Would you say? Uh, yes. Okay. So, bearing that in mind, I have two questions. One is, in the context of this case, what other physical evidence is there that um, places the defendant at the scene or as the perpetrator? Well, there's no question he was at the scene. He admits he was at the scene. He, he, um, so he testified that he was asked to be the lookout All while right. Roberto breaks also in. And there was a footprint, and he had blood on him, right? That's right. Okay. Now, when we move from that to the hair, the hair seems to me to be a bit cumulative. But what would that hair tell us about the crime? The hair or tells his intent or something like that. Sure. The hair suggests when he was there. How he's testifying. He, he comes in. He testifying. He comes in 20 minutes afterward. Finds Jennings on the floor, unconscious. He's been beaten. Ligature tied tightly around his neck, and which he, he which he tried to loosen. Roberto had told him this house was going to be unoccupied, and his intent was limited to assisting in a break and entering of an unoccupied home with an intent to steal those hairs in his hand. So that's evidence that he did not have the malice for murder. He didn't have an intent to commit assault and didn't know Riberio would. That's his testimony, right? That's and, right. And, but what does the evidence show us? The evi hair evidence. The what evidence. It, what was it used for in the case? The evidence about the sneaker print, the blood on him, that all could have come in as he testified after he entered. There's blood in, blood in there. He he's approaches Mr. Jennings, tries to loosen the thing, steps on the pillow. None of that shows he was there while the assault was taking place. The hair evidence turns that around. It's in his hand. That suggests he was he was in the, the house at the time the assault was taking place but and he very counsel, well participated in it. Counsel, may I just interrupt you on that, though? Sure. But, but wasn't there cross-examination on this that the hairs just could have fallen off uh, while he was in there uh, in that that's how they ended up there? I guess what I'm distilling down to is uh, he testified and all of these different kind of advocacy spins on there, they the jury just could not uh, basically just didn't believe him, right? Because he testified he wasn't in there. He testified that he was just a lookout. He testified that he had no part in the underlying crime. He testified to that. That's right. Right. And so why isn't it that the jury just didn't buy his testimony? Well, the point here is the importance that was put on this hair testimony. The prosecutor notes in his closing that. Uh, Jennings' hand is underneath him. How could that hair have gotten in his hands if uh, Eagles had not been in there taking part in this assault? That's, that's the argument. He, you know, that, that explains why he, how, how he was there inside at the time of the assault. It's that hair that's that critical physical sure. evidence that puts him there at that time. But, but let me go back to a point that you made earlier in your argument. It's just the statistical stuff that was incompetent, right? I mean, he could still testify to the comparison that he thought this was a hair from the defendant's head, right? Uh, I don't think so, no, Your Honor. In the same way that uh, DNA match evidence is inadmissible without statistical support, uh, 
hair comparison evidence should equally be inadmissible. Mm -hmm. In Tarver, this court said the reason hair comparison comes in is because it can eliminate a large class of people. Mm -hmm. Without statistical support, you can no longer say that. But That's no longer true. The point is that, uh, that you can testify consistent with, but not really beyond that because we don't know the percentage of the population. Right, there's no clue as to, I mean, in this case, he would have to admit you know, e e even if his testimony could come in, I believe it's consistent without statistical support, this would have been a very different trial because he would have had to admit he doesn't know how many people might have matching hair. He doesn't know how often he or other people get it wrong. And most importantly, at this trial in 1987, trial counsel had no reason to question those statistics. They were generally accepted at that right. time. So he concedes my client's hairs were found in, in Mr. Jennings' hand. And he says, that's the canon in the case. That's what he said. And th that put him in the pretty much impossible position of trying to explain how those hairs could have gotten in Mr. Jennings' hand if he hadn't been inside at the time of the assault. I, I don't want to try and distill your whole argument to one sentence, but is it that with that evidence there was no chance of anything other than a guilty? With the hair evidence? I think with the hair evidence, it was, that's pretty overwhelming evidence that he was in there at the time of the assault and may well have participated in it. Because as, as the a, a district attorney argued, how else could those hairs have gotten into his hands at that time, given the position he was, his body was in when he was found, found inside? But if you take away the statistical testimony, trial counsel would not have conceded that those were his Michael Eagle's hairs in Jennings' hand. He, he, he would, could have he argued might, these he might, not have, he might not have conceded that, but he still had to contend with there was a bloody footprint on the pillowcase. There was blood found on Mr. Eagle's, right? Right, and, and all of that could come in exactly the way Mr. Eagle's testified. He came in afterwards. I agree, but the point I'm making, I keep going back to, is he testified to all of that. And why isn't it even without the hair evidence that the jury just was free to disbelieve his testimony. They were free to disbelieve, but I think it's the hair evidence, it's the critical link here that pushed them into saying, you know, I don't believe this testimony. He says, says he didn't come in until after, afterwards, and this hair evidence shows he did come in there beforehand. It's the hair evidence that makes his testimony so incredible. Mm -hmm. You take that away, and this is a very different case. Mm -hmm. Trial counsel could have argued these hairs could have come from Roberio or anyone else who might have been in that uh, house at any time. Because keep in mind that um, those hairs were found in Jennings' hand along with grassy material and what appeared to be Jennings' own hairs. So those hairs could have been on the floor for who knows how long and gotten in Jennings' hand when, as the prosecutor argued, he was being dragged from room to room to look in, in the search for money. Can that, I, can that's I just the ask critical a quick link question here. Question about the evidence: um, the bloody footprint on the foot on the pillowcase. Isn't that wasn't that the ligature around? Hmm? Was that the ligature around uh, the victim's neck? No, this, this is a separate a separate pillowcase, I believe. Yeah, this is a separate pillowcase. So if you take away the statistical evidence in this case. The Commonwealth's evidence that he was inside at the time of the assault is much, much weaker. And that's the, that's the evidence that suggests that, in fact, he had the malice, the intent and knowledge necessary for murder and armed robbery. Without that, just the, the mere fact that the omission of the statistical evidence would have turned an important concession by the defense into a disputed issue for the jury to consider is alone enough to show that the statistical testimony was a real factor. That's what I wanted to ask you. The standard is that it has to be, we have to consider it to have been a real factor in the jury's deliberation, right. correct? And so how does that, um, how do we discern that from the record? Well, again, I think you discern, again, a real factor doesn't mean necessarily it would have proved, you know, proven his innocence. Is, is this a factor the jury consider? And in Cowles, this court said that evidence that's more credible than any other on an important issue likely would be a real factor. And in this case, the hair evidence is far and away the strongest evidence, putting him in, the, in that trailer at the time of the assault, suggesting he participated in the assault, and therefore that he must have had the malice, Again, the malice and I, intent I necessary to, for this. I am still, still not quite getting how the blood evidence is not relevant to timing, but the hair evidence is? The blood evidence 
could have gotten on Mr. Eagles in exactly the way he testified after he comes in. That says nothing about when he was there. Hair, Eagles hair in Jennings' hand, you wonder how could that have gotten there if, if he only came in after he was unconscious? It's virtually impossible. The hair evidence is the evidence that suggests he was there while Jennings was standing up, trying to struggle and keep, and, you know, keep, get the, get, and not have his money be stolen. The hair evidence is what puts him there earlier before Jennings was unconscious on the floor. And that's the only evidence that puts him there at that time. What about the occult blood on his hands and underneath his fingernails? He acknowledges he went in there, he bent over Jennings, touched him, tried to loosen the ligature. He acknowledges all that. So again, none of the blood evidence puts him there at the earlier time. The hair evidence is the only evidence that puts him inside that apartment prior to Jennings being unconscious on the floor, suggesting he took part in this assault. So that was critical evidence to show that he had the intent and knowledge necessary to commit the you know, murder by extreme atrocity or armed robbery, which becomes felony murder. Counsel, could I go back to the point that Justice Lowy brought up? Let's, let, do you concede that he could have testified that it's consistent with Mr. Eagle's hair? No, I do not. I mean, again, I think this is like, in, in the same way that evidence of a DNA match is inadmissible without statistical support, because without statistical support, you can't say it eliminates anybody. Same thing here, without, without statistical evidence showing it would have eliminated a large class of people, his opinion that is consistent should be inadmissible. Do we do well, that with fingerprints? But again, even if that is admissible, the trial would have been so different uh, if he could only enter that without, without any statistical evidence that, that it still would have been a real factor for the reasons I've already stated. Well, if, if, if you're wrong about the fact that he could have testified that it was consistent, right. would you say that the prosecution could still then use that to argue at closing that he was in there when it went down. Sure, sure right. they could argue that. Okay. Yeah, but I think it would have been a much weaker argument without the statistical support. And again, counsel would no longer have been conceding it was Eagle's hair in his hands. That would have been a contested issue. Mm -hmm. And he would, got, Mr. Godless would have had to acknowledge he had no, many, no idea how many people might have matching hair, how often he or other examiners make mistakes on these things. But so at that least, would have been a very different with, trial. But at least with the consistency component of it, mm -hmm. he was cross-examined on that, right? I mean, didn't he t didn't, wasn't there cross-examination about there's something to the follicle that, that, that suggests it was pulled out versus some, some other way that it fell out? What, wasn't there? Oh, cross, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, so cross -examined yeah, he that. was cross examined on, 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 on those points. Right. Right. So, so that wasn't enough. No, it wasn't enough because again, how would it get into his hand? And I mean, if Eagles is there and a the hair is loose, it didn't have to be pulled out. If a hair is in his scalp and loose, if it's on his shirt and Jennings touches him, it could have gotten in his hand, but how does it get in his hand? If Eagles is only in there, after the assault is over, he's unconscious, and Mr. Jennings' hand is under his back. How can it happen? It, it's really, it's, it's a difficult argument for counsel to make. Mm -hmm. And he had a hard, obviously his argument was unsuccessful. Without the statistical evidence, though, it'd be a very different trial, even if God bless you could testify the hair was consistent, yeah. even if you could testify to that. Jed, I have two final, two, I just have two more questions for you. One is, on the statistics for the hair, do we require statistics for um, fingerprints? No. And should we? Uh, well, there's certainly some issues have been raised about the reliability of fingerprint evidence. So that's certainly something that might be considered at some point if we get learn more about the scientific basis for fingerprint evidence. Right. And then, then my other, other question is, what effect would our ruling in this case have um, on all of our other we must have other cases in the pipeline and in the past where hair evidence has been used. How should we handle all of those cases? Uh, I think, well, I think, again, my, my position is that the hair comparison should be excluded in its entirety, but the question then becomes uh, the same prejudice issue arises in this case. How important was the hair evidence in the context of this case, of, of that particular case? In this case, I think when there was no other evidence suggesting Eagles was in the trailer before Mr. Jennings was unconscious, it's a critical difference. In other cases, it might not be that important. So it's a case-by-case -case decision, I think. Could I uh, uh, go back to whether or not 
consistent with would be permissible. Mm -hmm. What did the, uh, the FBI report in 2015 that referenced that you can't indicate a probability or improbability number? Mm -hmm. Did that report in any way address whether consistent with was or wasn't a permissible question? Well, it certainly said that an analyst could test of, could conclude that hairs are consistent, but whether the admissibility, whether that's admissible to court was certainly not an issue that was being raised by the FBI or uh, the other participants in that, in that study at the time. So they were saying an analyst, analyst could conclude it was consistent, but without any statistical support. That's all they could say. So whether that's admissible is it not a question for the FBI, it's a question for in here, the, the, this court. Okay, so because uh, Godleski's testimony about the hair comparison was a real factor in the deliberate, likely was a real factor in deliberations, Michael Eagle should be granted a new trial. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Attorney Hanson. Good morning, Arna Hanson for the Commonwealth. <clears throat> With respect to this conviction, it should be upheld. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. The hair doesn't change anything in this analysis. Well, how could you say that when the prosecutor spent time saying uh, that that was the thing that put uh, the defendant in the you know, trailer at the time of the assault? So there's two factors here. There's other physical evidence that links the defendant to the attack. And there's the fact that he's a joint venture. So with respect to the other evidence, we've already touched upon it. He has, he's covered in the victim's blood. Yeah, but what puts him there at the time of the assault, which would lead to the, um, you know, knowing of the consent, of the intent? So the, defen uh, the defendant explained at trial that he was a lookout for 20 minutes, and then he went inside. When he went inside, he found the co-defendant standing over the victim in the living room and he was already unconscious and he had a, the pillowcase Right, and so then him. the prosecutor in closing argument says, well, how do you, you know, that just doesn't make sense because the hair, uh, given the statistics, was um, there underneath the body in the hand of the victim. Right, so then the defendant continues and states, at that point we started searching the trailer for the money and that's when we uncovered the money. That testimony ignores the fact that the victim was dragged around the trailer. There was blood in every single room that was dripping on all the surfaces in that room, which suggests that he was being dragged around the trailer. And that was done so that it could find his hidden hiding spots while he was still conscious. Okay, so I guess you're ignoring my point. The prosecutor makes a big deal in closing argument about the fact that there's a hair in the, in the hand underneath the body of the victim and uses that to say, well, that's, that is inconsistent with the defendant's testimony. Right, that was just one piece of it. The fact but that it's a big piece, right? Because uh, uh, defense counsel has already conceded that that's the canon uh, that he can't explain. Right, it was just one piece. Now, the, the second part of it but, is- but, but, but it is just one piece, but why is that not uh, something uh, that would have had a real effect? given the emphasis that the prosecutor placed on it and the defense counsel went to great lengths to try to explain through some tape. Because of the, um, the physical evidence, again, he's covered. He's not, he just doesn't have a little bit of blood. Every part of his clothing, as well as underneath his fingernails, has blood on it. With the, typo blood? And correct. how rare is that? I'm sorry? How rare is that? I don't know. Yeah. And was that in evidence at all? No. Would it surprise you to know that 40% of us have typo blood? That, that's new to me. Mm -hmm. Counsel, second, could, I, could I go back to it, just try to put a fine point on Justice Wendland's question? Because I don't know that uh, if you agree with Attorney Shedd's position, but there, I, I, I separate this out into two things. There's the statistical information that he testifies to that we know he can't, right? Correct. But could he have testified that on his analysis, the hairs that were found in the victim's hand were consistent with Mr. Eagles? That is my understanding. Um, through my research, I have not come across anything that suggests that you can't make that comparison anymore, that the statistics have been ruled as um, wrong science. 
my research has also shown that microscopy has fallen out of favor as DNA analysis sure. has become more relevant. But but it, it goes back to the the uh, Justice Wenland's point and, and the the one that zeroes in on the closing argument because if he could testify to it's consistent with the defendant's hair, he could argue at closing argument. The only way it got there is because he was there, couldn't he? Yes, I agree with Your Honor. And you wouldn't need the statistical part of that to support that argument. I agree. Okay. And do you think that that would survive Do Dobert? That's something consistent with, even though there's no statistics to back it up, that would get come in as admissible evidence, as a quasi-expert evidence? Is that, that would certainly be a challenge. That, that would be a challenge, wouldn't it? So the admissibility of even the consistent with would be a problem. Is that the Commonwealth's position? I, I would agree that's fair. So we would have to, in, in assessing the argument here on a motion for a new trial, consider the possibility that even the consistent with would not have been admissible, given the lack of statistical basis. So basically, the hair expert would not have been allowed to testify. I wouldn't go that far, Your Honor. I would, so he, he explained what his analysis was, that he compared them on, I believe, 10 major and then several other minor comparisons. I believe that he would have been able to say, I looked at this part of the hair and it was, it was, it was similar there. And I go through each one of his 10 to 15 factors and compare those on that. Even and though there's no statistical basis for making that assessment of consistency? Yes, uh, I guess the jury the issue, could draw their own conclusions. I guess the that. question might be, uh, by way of analogy, the DNA evidence, the non-exclusion evidence requires a number. You can't just say um, this is non-exclusion. Inconclusive is not admissible, and, and um, non-exclusion uh, uh, requires statistics. So the question is whether or not that analysis would carry over to to hear follicles as well. Right. Um, I don't have an answer for the court on that one. I think ultimately, he's a joint venturer in this case. He, what's important here is that Ruberio was clearly the initial planner. There's testimony at trial that he was looking for somebody else to go with him and two other people testified that they didn't want to participate in this. This crime didn't happen until Michael Eagle signed on. Right. The, 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 there's significant evidence, no, no doubt about it. And uh, the defendant may well have uh, been convicted uh, without the hair. It may well have. So whether, whether or not uh, uh, this evidence is enough for a new trial, uh, you do need to confront that, that the, again, picking up on the point from Justice Winland, that, that the prosecutor is saying the hair could not have landed there accidentally underneath the body. And so therefore, the defendant's story about when he went into the trailer uh, is not credible. And whether or not that type of evidence uh, is enough here for, for a new trial. It's not whether or not you wouldn't have had um, uh, significant evidence that, that, that he was guilty. Right. I, I think at the end of the day, even without that evidence, he's still a joint venture where he admits that he was a lookout. He admits that he goes in. Venture on a, on a, on a breaking and entering, though. To, to be the joint venture on the, on, on the felony murder or on the extreme atrocity of cruelty, he has to uh, share the intent. But this was a felony murder where he would have to share the intent for the armed robbery. And to share the intent for the armed robbery, you have to know that he was armed, that, that there was somebody inside? Correct. It doesn't answer all the questions because you have to share the intent for the armed robbery. And, you, and, and what the defendant's saying, maybe the, just the church makes a good point, maybe the jury's just not going to credit him. He's right there on the witness stand. But uh, you have to show the shared intent for the armed robbery. Right, and there's plenty of evidence from the scene that it was clear that the victim was home. This was an isolated area where the, the defendants needed a car to access. They then sneak up on the property. They see that the, the car is in the driveway. The lights are on. The outside porch is latched. Two people testified that you could see into the living room through the window. The victim was watching television at the time. It would have been abundantly clear 
that somebody was home. And they knew somebody was home because they pulled the phone wires out to prevent the victim from calling for help. So even if he went there for a B&E, it was clear that the victim was home, at which point it turned into an armed robbery. Which at least gets you to the felony murder. Correct. Now, with respect to the last portion of my argument, in all the cases that have been overturned, we have affirmative DNA evidence stating that this person was actually not linked to this crime scene. And I'm referring to Sullivan as well as Cowles, where they went back and did a DNA test and said, you know what, this one piece of physical evidence that links this individual to this crime scene no longer exists. And we don't have that here. Can you refresh my memory on Cowles? In Cowles, a young girl was murdered, and the two co-defendants that did it came back to an apartment and washed up afterwards. There was blood on a towel that they used to dry themselves off, and that was used to tie them to the murder. They went back and tested the blood on the towel, and the DNA testing showed that the hair or the blood did not belong to either the defendants or the victim. And now in Cowles, the court also held that there's a substantial difference between a test that says that this affirmatively does not belong to either the defendant or the victim or any other person that might be in question, and a test that is inconclusive. Essentially, if we throw out, well, we should, the, the statistical probability is gone. That, that's not scientifically valid. But if we just ignore that and throw it out of this, um, this case, we still have an inconclusive result here. Those, we don't know where the hairs came from. We can't say that they didn't come from eagles. Is that the burden I, on the motion for a new trial? I thought, we, I thought it was, would it have had a real effect on the jury? That, that is correct. But okay. I, I, I thought it was just important to point that out. That it, If we look at Goudreau, it's important to look at information that could have been analyzed when determining whether a motion for a new trial should have been allowed. And here, the defendant has explicitly not tested the D, uh, using DNA tests that tested the hairs. This could have, would have been a, a substantially more direct way to attack his conviction. And I would suggest to the court that it's important to note that they chose not to do that. Rather, they chose to attack it laterally by saying that the statistical probabilities are no longer good science. So you're suggesting that DNA testing could still be done of the hair? That is a possibility, yes. And, that, and I, my understanding is that the defendant did not follow up on that. Did the Commonwealth? I did follow up. Um, I got, I never heard back from the lab. They stated that they were going to send me an inventory, and I never received that, unfortunately. Did the defendant know that um, the co venturer was armed? So that's where Commonwealth Booth comes in, which I reference. Um, even if he doesn't know that he's armed when he goes in initially, if he becomes aware of the fact that he's armed during the, um, during the co-venture and then continues in the co-venture, um, he, he would have the requisite intent. So you don't need to know that he's armed at the beginning, but if you become aware of it, that's enough. And what's the evidence that he became aware of it? He walked in to the trailer and Ruberio's armed himself with a shotgun and the victim has been beaten. The physical evidence suggests that he was strangled with a ligature, specifically the pillowcase, but that he was also attacked with a chair which was also covered in blood that was um, inside of the victim's. But what is the evidence that the defendant um, was there at that time when all of that, all these things that you're listing happened? Well, that, that, I don't believe that matters, the fact that, that it happened before, but he was still acting as a lookout, as a core venture. I think that's what's important here. He doesn't need to be present. He doesn't need to be. But, but how, you're saying that that's how he knew that the, uh, his, his co-defendant was armed because he was present when all these things were happening inside the trailer. No, I'm stating that once he walked into the trailer and he saw the defendant with a shotgun, I think it's reasonable to infer the defendant had armed himself while beating this individual. But you're saying that as long as you find out even after the, the crime has occurred, then you can be- was During the commission of the crime, correct. Yeah, how do you, what's the evidence, I guess that's my question. What is the evidence that the defendant 
found out during the commission of the crime um, that these things were happening. He walked in and he saw the victim laying on the floor unconscious with a ligature around his neck. He you testified. Relying on his testimony. Sorry. You, are you relying on his testimony? Correct. For that? He testified to that, and he, he testified that he tried to loosen the ligature as well. He's well aware of the fact. But how that, do we know that happened before or after? Oh, that would be based on his testimony. That would be based on the defendant's testimony. If we the, take the defendant testified that he was there after. Correct, but it was still during the commission of the robbery. The victim is beaten unconscious. He's strangled with a ligature. The defendant says he then walks in, and then they continue, and that's when they start to rob him and steal all of his money, and then they make their escape. So can I ask you, are you, are you relying on, on, on case law for the armed robbery that even if um, uh, the victim is deceased in the immediate aftermath of uh, of the robbery, excuse me, of the of the death, that there's something stolen, that it would be still a robbery. Yes, um, I, I would point the court to uh, to Booth, where they, the robbery was of drugs, mm -hmm. um, and two people were shot during the commission of that. And in that case, the conviction was upheld, and all the defendant who was Booth was doing was acting as a lookout. Here, the defendant did substantially more where he acted as a lookout, but then went inside and aided in the robbery. He's seen with a wad of cash after the fact. He has coins that are taken from the victim's beer sign that he offers to one of his roommates to pay um, for household expenses. So he certainly profited in, um, in the robbery as well. Did Booth claim that he didn't know that the, uh, his co-venture was armed? He did initially, um, but the court inferred that he should have known ahead of time, so it was a, they, were, they robbed a drug dealer. It, it, they, it could have been inferred that they were going to use weapons to rob a drug dealer because they're robbing a drug dealer. The other thing right. was... So they knew someone was home, and they, so that's why... Correct. Um, but even during the commission of the robbery in Booth, um, two people were shot, uh, which I would have been loud. I think I did the case, so I remember, yeah. Um, and the defendant stayed outside. So it would have been reasonable to infer from the fact that gunshots came from inside the house that a weapon had been used and he still continued to participate. Yeah, I understand. But the, the difference is just when, if the person doesn't know that the co-defendant is armed until after the, you know, the victim has been hurt by <laughs> whatever the guy's been armed with, you know, is that still... The knowledge my, of the arming. Correct. Okay. That, that is my understanding. For the, the, my understanding of the takeaway from Booth is even after the fact, um, it, it would still be valid. Okay. 